so there are still a few seats here available in the front if you don't want to sit in the back. Don't be shy. Okay, good morning. Welcome uh, to IC Energy. Um, my name is Dirk Kutscher and my co-chair uh, Dave Oran is um, there on the screen. He's uh, joining remotely from Boston. Good morning. And um, yeah, let's get started um, with the meeting. Great to have you here. Um, quick usual... Well, <laughs> no, <laughs> just a moment. Do you want me to drive the slides? Or um, should yeah, okay. I should be able to do it, but it doesn't work. Um, okay. There we go. There we go. Um, okay, just the, the usual housekeeping notes. Um, so uh, please be aware that we are operating under um, the ITF IPR rules. So that, in short, that means um, you have to notify us if you contribute anything um, with. Um, IPR relevance, or if you um, see anything with IPR relevance. And um, yeah, please make sure you are signed in using the um, on-site meeting tool. Um, when you are presenting locally, um, there are two ways to uh, run your slides. You can use this clicker here, or you can um, use the online tool on your mobile phone, for example. Um, yeah, let's just um, remind, remind ourselves that we are doing research here. So this is not a standard setting um, activity. So we are in the IRTF and um, we are producing specifications that we um, hope to publish as experimental RFCs, but these are not internet standards in, in any way. And okay, just um, link to our mailing list and so on. Most importantly, uh, we need a note taker. Um, we cannot run the meeting without one. And ah, thank you very much, Rio. Uh, <laughs> can we um, have someone um, helping Rio? Um, so then it's quite useful to have one main note taker and then in case there are, he misses something that um, somebody can chip in using the, the online editor. So we don't expect um, this to be a very tough job today, but still it'd be good to, to have someone. Try. Okay, ah, cool, thanks. Yeah, so it's uh, linked from the IETF uh, agenda. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you both, that's, that's, that's very useful. Um, okay, our agenda. Um, so we're talking about um, Flick first. Um, Dave is going to talk about um, forwarding. And um, we have um, um, David talking about um, uh, and the end test bit activities. And Kuhan is talking about collective communications. And um, uh, Sue Ting is talking about uh, microservice architectures. Anything that people want to add or change on with the agenda? Great. Um, so just a quick um, few updates. Or, um, let's just review our um, drafts that we um, aim to publish. Um, so um, we have recently been able to move a few drafts forward. So um, like both, both trace route and ping have been sent to the RFC editor. So we expect some RFCs coming out soon. Same for um, path steering. And um, so time TLV um, had seen um, a few minor updates. Um, so um, thanks for paying attention. And um, so we're currently waiting for, I think for Colin to, to move this forward. And um, yeah, Flick, we are going to talk about um, today. So um, that's the one we want to get um, done next. All right, so um, let's start with um, um, the forwarding update um, from, from Dave. Do, Dave, do we have slides for that actually? Or? No, because uh, there isn't much to say. So okay. we can probably get through this pretty quickly. Um, so 
uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the spec and haven't written, uh, haven't uh, read it yet, um, this is an extension to the CCNX and NDN protocols um, to allow them to do better than two-way handshake types of operations um, for applications that aren't simple content retrieval applications that are things like um, uh, getting sensor readings on IoT devices for uh, emulating the same kind of uh, interactions that you see in web transactions, uh, or RESTful web interactions, uh, and a variety of other uh, applications like remote method invocation uh, that require uh, a multi-way handshake. Um, and what we've done is attempted to preserve all the properties that we have in the CCNX and NDN architectures of, uh, of consumer anonymity um, and uh, there's all the security properties that we see um, on the return of data. So this has been uh, worked on for a while. Uh, it's still not adopted yet as an ICNRG item, but there ha it has been implemented. Uh, there's implementation uh, work still going on. Uh, actually, uh, in one of Dirk's students is, is doing work on it. And there's some probability that we'll get some work done uh, by the NIC folks in, in uh, Japan. So I think the status here uh, is twofold. One is uh, we need wider review of this specification. Uh, number two, uh, it seems to have sufficient interest due to the implementation um, activities and some of the uh, directions we're seeing in ICN in general in terms of what types of applications seem to be a good fit for the architecture. And hence, um, I think it's time to consider um, adopting this as an ICNRG item. So I think after this meeting, uh, Dirk and I will issue a, uh, an adoption call for this, and hopefully that will uh, provoke people uh, to give it a more serious uh, detailed review. Thanks. Thank, thanks, Dave. Are there any questions or comments on that? No, 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 no. Um, this is um, reflexive forwarding. Um, so we don't have slides for that. Um, yeah, so there, this, Dave. There's no real need for slides because no. a whole lot has changed in, in, the, in the specification itself. The main update is that we actually have uh, some experimentation and uh, research work going on using the spec. So it's become active uh, now uh, in the community and hence uh, I think it's time to call the question as to whether you want to adopt the work. Yeah. Yeah, so this would be um, needed for, say, more transactional communication in ICN. So normally um, we like to do things uh, in a data-oriented way. Um, but, um, of course, there are also interaction scenarios where you need to, for example, modify some state or issue an RPC request, these kind of things. And so we think that this is a good vehicle for achieving this and um, would be really grateful if people could have a look and also tell us concerns uh, because it's modifying the following behavior. Um, so that, that's why it's good to have a broad review of, of, of this um, specification. Great. Um, yeah, I'll also be available after this meeting to discuss this more if somebody has questions on this. Cool, let's move on. Um, and next up is Mark, and I give you the control of the slides. Okay, hello. Uh, let me just check my control here. If, aha, uh -huh. yes, that seems to be. Keep pressing now. All right, Fantastic. thank you. All right. All right. So uh, Flick, perhaps uh, we should figure out what the longest running draft has ever been, and uh, maybe we would qualify. So uh, I'm going to go over the uh, 05 update. So there were just a few changes since 04. Uh, I'll start with a real quick recap of what Flick is trying to do and then what the updates were. So Flick is providing a manifest uh, of uh, a 
object and it provides all the hash values. So you can request every specific object by hash name. Uh, it's hierarchical. So you can uh, retrieve either more manifests or more application data, depending upon what the hash points to. There's a canonical traversal order. And if you retrieve all the application data in that order, it should reassemble the original file as it was intended. And that will be important for later in the presentation. Um, and then has, has, I'll skip the rest of that. That's not too important for our, um, oh, right. So the interest construction techniques. So there's several interest construction techniques. So this is how a consumer will construct a name based on the information in the manifest and the uh, where it is in traversing the manifest. And um, the, the update that I'm gonna go over is to one of those name construction techniques. So there's something called the segmented schema. So this you know, is, is used by CCN or NDN when the publisher used a segment number in the name of the content object. So I took my file, I split it up to 100 objects, and I called them foo slash one, foo slash two, and so on through foo 100. Um, so when you use the segmented schema, uh, that means you have to uh, you know, construct, you know, figure out what the segment number is for every hash value that's in the manifest. Um, let's see here. So um, for normal sane usage, you would want to make the segment numbers be the same as the in order traversal of the manifest. So basically you're retrieving segment zero, segment one, segment two, segment three, you know, if you're following the uh, manifest in order traversal. Um, the, the problem is that doesn't always have to be true and there's some exceptions and those are be, gonna be some corner cases that I'll go over. So in the previous draft, the default concept was uh, the manifest would say, I'm using segment numbers for this prefix. And so you, the consumer, need to track them and figure it out. And that means that the consumer would need to remember the segment number between manifest objects. So when I you know, go between chained manifests, I have to remember what my previous segment number was. Uh, and it means that I basically have to retrieve every manifest and every object in order because uh, you know, I need to track this number that has you know, no explicit value anywhere. The other option that we gave in the previous draft was to use what we called annotated hash pointers. And you would give an explicit number for every hash. And so there, there'd be no remembering anything. I would just tell you for everyone what the, what the number is. Um, and uh, you know, for some things like audio video, you know, this, might, this is kind of useful because you might want to skip around and just say, you know, go to this other place and then I'll tell you what the segment number is when you go there. So you don't have to keep counting. Um, other types of uses might be for like deduplication apps or uh, things like that that might, you know, want to say, you know, use this segment number for it. The new option, uh, this was discussed at IETF 116 in the slides there, uh, it then it, and it then got put into the 05 draft, and this is what I'm going over today. Um, so instead of doing option one, where I just say you segment numbers and you the consumer figure out the number by going in order, um, every manifest object has uh, a field that says, what's the starting segment number? So I don't need to remember anything from object to object. Um, I could retrieve them in any order I want and it will always tell me where to start. 
and and then I just know the offset in the array of hash values that are in that one object. So it it, it makes the knowledge all a lot more local, uh, and uh, it's it, it should be much simpler to use in practice. Uh, the issues that uh, come up, well, you know, first just segment some notes on segment numbers. So in the O5 draft, the only real requirement that's in there is to say that for a given name prefix, a segment number should only be used once. That is, there's a unique hash value for that segment number. And, you know, I don't duplicate segment numbers when I'm segmenting my, my object. Uh, so that's a totally normal thing to do. Uh, it's not enforced anywhere, but that's what we ask for. Um, what Flick allows is that in the manifest, I could use a segment number more than once. Uh, I, you know, segment numbers uh, may not be used for the publisher. Maybe the publisher skipped five, but if you never put it in the manifest for me to retrieve, it doesn't really matter. Um, and the consumer is allowed to skip segments or go out of order. So th those are all things that are allowed. You know, they might or might not be good ideas. Um, and there we go, number two. Uh, so, you know, so for general sane use, you know, the publisher should do the obvious thing, go zero to N minus one. And the manifest, um, you know, should use a single method like the start segment ID or the annotated pointers. If you start mixing those, it gets messy. Um, and you would typically want the in order traversal to follow that, you know, zero to N minus one. So if you do all that, it, it, it you know, it, it all makes sense. And, um, uh, it, it shouldn't confuse anyone, and that's 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 what you would expect. But none of that is mandatory. We we just ask that you do that. Um, so what happens if you don't do those things? So what happens if the publisher uses an annotated hash group but only includes a segment ID annotation for some of the pointers? Well, if they included also a start segment ID then you're kind of mixing the two ways and 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 you could figure out numbers um but it's going to be really confusing for someone to debug and i don't know a good reason to do it like this but that is an allowed use and and there's a way to handle it uh, complication number two is what if the hash group uses segmented naming, but the hash group doesn't have a start segment ID. So you either have to use a start segment ID or you have to use annotated pointers. If you don't do those, then it's a malform manifest and you discard it. Uh, all right, so a publisher uses a regular hash group uh, with a start segmented naming. Uh, it includes a start segment ID for each hash group, but the numbers overlap. So this is the publisher did something weird. You know, for example, the first manifest starts at zero and has 10 objects. And the second manifest starts at five and has 10 objects. Well, when I reconstruct the application data, it has 20 objects, but five through nine and 10 through 14 are the same uh, pieces of data. Don't do that. I don't. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but you know, if you did it, that's what would happen. Um, you know, it, it's not an error to do that, but it's probably wrong. Uh, okay. So, um, inclusion here. So, uh, just just to reiterate. So, uh, when. Uh, uh, the data associated with, with this name constructor is assembled in the manifest in order traversal. So whatever that traversal is, is what is supposed to reconstruct the data. The segment numbers don't tell you how to reassemble it. They just name each, each piece of the assembly, right? So normally they would be a one-to-one -one thing, but they don't have to be. There's no way to enforce that. Um, the publisher can use segment numbers in a non-sane way, uh, but as long as the traversal works out, then, you know, whether or not it's a screwy way to use segment numbers, you know, it's correct. Um, really the only use of doing something 
wacky like this would be for data deduplication. That's the only real use case that I could think of for it. Um, all right, so hopefully that wasn't like too confusing, but um, uh, uh, you know, I, I can take any questions or discuss this. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Are there any questions? Uh, this is Alicia Zhang from UCLA. This is not a question, but the comments. I wasn't yeah. sure why you offered all this uh, flexibility or not offer those flexibility. That's really up to the producer, whichever way it wants to name the segments, right? Right. And, uh, we are actually, we'll try our implementation of an equivalent of this. Uh, I think we're going to do something very simple but a very systematic, mm -hmm. just the uh, number of the segments sequentially that makes, you know, get rid of all this uh, potential confusions and other complexities. Right. Yeah. And, and so, so I'm not saying you should do any of these non-sane things. You know, the, the, the preferred thing is you segment your data object like zero through K and and when in the manifest, they just are retrieved zero through K, you know, that, 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 that's the obvious thing. And that's what I would hope someone would do, but we don't say you must do that. And, 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 and so, um, uh, I, I, and I guess the, 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 the tricky thing is with the manifest, you reconstruct the object via the in order traversal of the manifest. Whatever the segment numbers are, they're just naming the data, but it's whatever you put in the manifest in order traversal is what constructs the, the data. Uh, let me just uh, say one more thing. I think maybe you want, you wish to leave uh, flexibility, but uh, the years of observation suggests that uh, at least in the spec, you should uh, suggest the safest way to do it, because otherwise, yes, people are gonna do the wrong way. Mm -hmm. I can tell you an early example mm -hmm. uh, in the DNS specification. The example to say, oh, you can put the TTL to be n second, and we watched a large number of implementation to put that precise number in the implementation, which is not <laughs> the right number. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah, we, we, we do recommend that you do it the obvious sane way. So that, that is the recommended use. Okay, next question, Rio. Rio Yanagida from University of Glasgow. Um, thank you. I think this is very interesting work. Um, what would be the next step? Um, right. Um, so... Uh, what I'd like to do is, you know, get these, uh, get, get Flick re-implemented. There's some like, you know, two or three draft to go code that's out there. Uh, so that needs to get updated and we need to experiment with it. Um, I'm willing to, you know, help anyone who might have resources to, to work on that, whether it's, you know, CCN or NDN or, you know, anything. Um, uh, yeah, I, I just don't have time to implement it myself in something. Are you looking for anyone to do that? Is that is that the is that the call here right now? Are you are you soliciting a volunteer? Yeah, right oh, now? sure, sure. If if there's someone interested in in, in working with manifests, I, I'm uh, I'm happy to help as much as I can. So thank you. So Mark, you, you had this uh, Python implementation, right? So that's still available online somewhere. Yeah, there, there is a Python implementation. Um, it it was so so uh, that implementation would essentially take a file and create all the content objects out of it, um, and, and just serialize them onto the disk as uh, you know in CCNX wire format. Um, uh, so 
you know, the, the low hanging fruit would just be to update that code to the current draft. But I, I'd really like to either use like NDN Python or, or something to, to get you know, a live version going. Hi, uh, Michael Tumim, Invisible College. I'm also uh, working on, this is my first time seeing this, but it looks similar to some of the work we do where we have um, a large file constructed from many patches um, when we're editing the file over time. And it is very convenient to have runs of uh, contiguous blocks be numbered sequentially. But when you do edit the file, you'll end up with different segments of contiguity. Um, and so possibly I'm just imagining that what's happening here is it's nice to have that property when you can, but you want to allow it not to happen sometimes as well. Um, and it might be the case that just when doing optimizations, it, it'll, it'll become actually meaningful when it exists and when it doesn't exist. Um, and if that's the case, I'd be happy to speak more. Um, or if there's anything, if this touches anything in your mind, I'd be happy to speak more and, uh, with okay. you and see if we can improve things. Yeah, yeah, we, we we had done something called difference-based networking a long time ago, like 2013 or 2014, around there, where, you know, basically once we had the data encoded in these manifest trees, we could then essentially apply diffs to that and, and just stitch out parts of the manifest. Um, and, and, uh, uh, so so yeah that, that 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 maybe that would be interesting to to talk to you about um great thanks um yeah mark just for your info for everybody's info so there is a um group of people um here currently this week um, who are um bringing forward some proposals on state synchronization and we're trying to figure out um you know, what of this work could be, say, IETF or RTF relevant. So I think this connects um, a little bit to this work and also to like data set reconciliation that people in the in the uh, ICN community have done. Mm -hmm. um, um, maybe that could be a topic for, for our next meeting. Okay. Great. Um, yeah, thanks, Mark. Thank you, everybody. And um, so let's move on. So in um, in IC Energy, um, we generally want to encourage um, um, experiments, more practical work, um, you know, learning about how real systems work, and um, that's why we um, invited um, Davide and his um, co-authors to share their work on um, NDN testbed and traffic traces. So there was a paper at the ICN conference this year. I think they would probably mention it. And um, that was really interesting. So then we invited them to um, kind of inform the community and uh, maybe also get some more interested people to use this and uh, work with them. So I'm happy to have um, Davide. I hope I pronounced the name correctly here and give you control of the slides, you should be able to use your cursor keys. Okay, and I hope you can hear me. Yep. And you should be able to see me as well. Yep. Okay, um, I have a timer here that says one minute, uh, 30 seconds. Let me fix that. Okay, thanks. <laughs> All right, so before I start, uh, thanks. Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Dirk and Dave uh, for inviting me here. Um, and I don't know if any of the other co-authors of my co-authors are here. Um, I think that maybe Sosmate might be here, but I'd like to acknowledge all of them, Sakalpa and Sosmate from Tennessee Tech, um, and um, Zhu Xiao and Lotfi are my colleagues uh, at NIST. Um, so this, uh, as Dirk said, um, this is a sort of expanded and updated version of, of a recent presentation it was just a, a month ago, less than a month ago, uh, that we uh, we did, SUSMIT did at the uh, ACM ICN in Iceland. And um, I'd like to focus more today on uh, the collection side and on the testbed side of the presentation. Um, so I changed the title because of that. Um, and uh, starting from that, 
I want to say what the limitations and the caveats of our work are, and from that, uh, in turn, uh, see where where the community where we would like to get feedback and input from the community um, to you know to take the next steps uh, to, to take move this work forward um, and make it as beneficial as possible for for the entire research community. So let me start with the the why. Um, I think uh, uh, everybody knows why uh, traffic traces are important for for research. Um, some of the reasons I can mention are the they enable um, comparing different uh, protocols and designs in a sort of apple to apple comparison. Uh, they allow us to get reproducible results out of our simulations, and uh, not just simulations, but um, a number of other tests in a sort of controlled environment, so that uh, in turn we can we can have better comparisons of different algorithms and protocols. Um, in the case of NDN specifically, um, there's been a constant uh, request for these traces because thanks to the traces we can. A better test uh, uh, potential designs for forwarding strategies and caching policies that are uh, especially the forwarding strategies are key elements of the NDN forwarder architecture and so uh, lots of research opportunities there and we need to enable this research and uh, traffic traces are one of the elements that enable uh, research in this area um, more traditionally, and also not just for NDN, but this probably applies to, to networking more generally, uh, performance measurements and um, optimization and tuning based on the traces and troubleshooting uh, issues with the network, so more generally debugging, uh, not just with the network, but also uh, application developers that want to know how their application is behaving on a certain network. Um, we have Look at, looked at some of the approaches that have been taken so far in the, uh, let's say, attempt uh, to produce uh, traffic traces for NDN, um, mainly in three. I don't claim that this is a, you know, um, exhaustive uh, survey of all the uh, methods, but the, the main approaches are starting from existing uh, uh, tr traces of existing protocols and wide widespread protocols such as HTTP or NFS that have a sort of a hierarchical naming structure um, in in the you know path components of the HTTP uh, request or uh, of a URL really and um, in the NFS because uh, you're, you're moving essentially files and file systems are typically hierarchical so and there's a long list of issues when doing this. Most notably, I will mention that this is this may not uh, really capture the full semantics of NDN names, and it may not reflect uh, or represent uh, at all how native NDN apps uh, interact with each other or will behave in the future when, when these applications are being designed uh, for NDN and not just copied over uh, from an HTTP world. The second uh, approach is a synth uh, synthesizing uh, traces. And again, this is um, sort of a chicken and egg problem because how do you synthesize it based on what parameters? And until applications are developed, you don't really know what to base your uh, synthetic traces on. So we took a third approach, which is uh, try to use uh, uh, realistic or as realistic as possible um, deployment of NDN and uh, run some real applications on this on this deployment and capture the traffic it's uh, as simple as that um, but there's a lot of details um, so the main goals of our work is mainly the data set of these traces and a toolkit a software toolkit that allows anybody uh, to use these traces but also to um, capture their own traces. And so each piece of this trace of, of this toolkit is supposed to be modular so that if you don't want to, or if for some reason that, uh, that our data set doesn't work for your research, you can take 
um, the scripts that we have and uh, the programs, the tools that we have developed and uh, capture your own traffic, for instance, on your own topology or using your applications. And then you can replicate and, and uh, um, you know, replay those traces in your simulations. Another part of the toolkit is a proof of concept uh, uh, tracer replayer uh, that can be used, uh, for instance, in NDN Sim, uh, which is a uh, simulator, NDN simulator <clears throat> based on NS3. Um, but let's move to the, let's talk about how we did this trace collection. So we created um, a traffic damper uh, specifically for, for this purpose. The dumper uh, simply uh, dumps uh, the tra uh, NDN traffic from any Ethernet adapter that you want to run it on, and, and also for from the loopback interface because on the NDN testbed, which is where we run the dumper on, as we'll see as we'll see later, uh, the uh, WebSocket traffic goes through an NG nginx proxy and then through the loopback interface. So in order to capture the WebSocket, the NDN over WebSocket traffic, we had to also capture loopback traffic. Um, but this is not really important too much. What I want to focus on is uh, the, the dumper eventually creates a, a pickup or a pickup NG file with all the traffic in there. Um, the traffic uh, is uh, anonymized in a so far very simple way. Um, we are simply uh, zeroing out all the content, uh, the content field of the NDN bucket, uh, of the NDN data packet, and the application parameters field in the in, NDN interest packets. Uh, there's, in addition to giving a little bit of anonymization, it also greatly increases the compression efficiency. And uh, for as for uh, as far as the lower layer protocols are concerned, we're simply, um, you know, sort of masking the uh, a least significant byte of, of the IP addresses or the MAC address uh, with a random key that's generated uh, when the tool starts. So this is an open area of, you know, we hope that there will be more, de more development here in the future. It could be even an area of research as far as the you know, NDN anonymiz anonymization techniques are concerned. You may say, yeah, there's, there's uh, some information may leak through the name itself so that's that's an open uh, an open question essentially. Um, so we use this tool on uh, a combination of the NDN testbed, the NDN uh, what what we call global NDN testbed, <clears throat> and and the fabric testbed. The uh, NDN dumper, uh, the NDN T dump that I just introduced was de deployed on. Uh, four NDN routers in North America. And um, yeah, I'll, I will say more about this later. Uh, why the applications, in addition, uh, in addition to the traffic that is you know, organically flowing uh, on the testbed, uh, we, ha we had to generate, uh, there's not much of that kind of traffic on the testbed, or there wasn't at least uh, in, in earlier this year when we did our experiments. So we sort of had to generate some additional traffic, uh, which is, you may say, might say not super real, but it's at least realistic in the sense that we use the real applications that were developed for real users in order to uh, generate this traffic. And these applications were deployed on Fabric uh, in uh, locations of the United, in the United States. Um, so a bigger picture here, this is, I realize, not very readable. Um, so I put a better picture of the end global and the testbed uh, with all the, lo the locations of the routers. Uh, the, the routers are not super well maintained. Uh, historically, haven't been super well maintained. So they go up and down all the time. And uh, so it's not super stable. The topology is not super stable. There's always. Oh, it, it's almost always working, uh, but the number of links uh, uh, may not be, the degree of the nodes may not be very high at uh, any given point in time. Uh, but it works. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned, four, four, uh, four routers in North America, um, where we deployed uh, our 
traffic damper <clears throat> at UCLA, um, at uh, Washington University in St. Louis, at the University of Arizona in Tucson, and uh, at the University of Memphis in Memphis. And uh, the, uh, the end hosts that were, as I said, running on Fabric, we deployed uh, two kinds of applications. Uh, one is a file transfer application that is simply sort of emulating a sort of bulk data transfer. Um, and another one is a video streaming, uh, YouTube-like. Uh, we ran this over a number of weeks, uh, but the main part of the traces that we collected and, and the, the data set that we later published uh, was captured over the course of a week uh, for three hours, uh, three hours per day uh, for seven days, basically. So 21 hours of traffic. Uh, the total capture, the traffic amounts to about 320 gigabytes, a little over a million, 100 million packets. And uh, it's uh, it's published. It's public. Anybody can go to to that repository and download download the packet traces and use them for whatever you need them for. Um, we um, classified the traces in seven scenarios, uh, depending on the type of traffic that was flowing on the testbed in, in that particular scenario. From a baseline, from a baseline scenario where there was just uh, basically an NLSR traffic. NLSR is the NNDN routing daemon, so basically uh, control plane traffic, um, and other tested users. But as you can see from the table here, there was not a lot of traffic, just with the baseline. Uh, so we introduced our applications as, as I explained earlier: file transfer, video streaming. Uh, scenario B and C, and then increasingly more complex uh, scenarios where we interleave the, the applications. Um, we we change the number of producers and consumers, um, or rather, I should say, the number of producer locations and consumer locations. The number of actual instances uh, was was random, randomized, and and would would change over time. The applications would come online and offline randomly over the course of the of the three hours, uh, but they were connected to either all in one location or, or uh, spread across three three locations or three routers. Um, and then in the last scenario, uh, we also we were also spreading them across uh, uh, different uh, areas where the NDN testbed does not have a presence, but the fabric uh, testbed uh, does have uh, a site there. So. The scenario G has essentially potentially higher latency in the last hop compared to the previous scenarios. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on analyze on the analysis we did of the traces, um, but we did some analysis. I think the main uh, one of our main goals is to produce the traces, make the traces available, and then. Uh, you know, we would hope uh, other researchers would come in and analyze these traces and tell us more about how the forwarder is, be is behaving, um, how the routing protocol is behaving, how the, you know, uh, control plane uh, is, is handling routing changes, uh, how the forwarding strategy is behaving on a testbed, and so on. And any kind of insights that can be uh, gleaned from, from the traces uh, require a much more in-depth analysis that we've done here and for this paper. So I, yeah, so I don't want to spend too much time on this. Our hope is that others would come in and do a more in-depth analysis. Uh, but yeah, we, do, we did look at the, um, how the uh, name components and name length was distributed and the uh, name prefixes. Here you can see, for instance, the file server so the file server and the video servers, which were our applications, are those that generate the most uh, traffic, the majority of the traffic. But there is also some NLSR, some uh, sync traffic, some ping the traffic. Um, here you can see the uh, the throughput, uh, and and you can infer that there there, there is some uh, uh, 
there is some benefit from either interest aggregation or, or caching at uh, uh, some of the routers. Um, for instance, uh, as you can see, UCLA was the producer in this case, and the other three locations were running consumers. As you can see, the amount of traffic received at UCLA is not the sum of all three of these, which would normally happen if you just had a traditional protocol, let's say. Uh, in this case, uh, caching or aggregation are, are beneficial in reducing the amount of bandwidth uh, that, UCLA, that the UCLA router is receiving or has to, has to serve. Um, more detailed, uh, more detailed look at the interest lifetime field in the in the packet and the freshness period in the data packet. Uh, hop limit uh, here. It's interesting. It's interesting to see that how the the basically all the values are clustered around three uh, three peaks. Uh, Thirty. Uh, what is it? Thirty two, sixty four, and two hundred fifty five, uh, which are basically the default uh, settings for the hop limit that are used in different Daniel implementations. Uh, it could be a forwarder adding the hop limit uh, if there was none in the incoming packet, or it could be uh, a client library that encodes the a, a default hop limit when, when the packet is sent. And uh, here just to you know show that we can drill down uh, into one specific uh, one specific application in this case, uh, it's NLSR, so kind of a special application, but uh, we can look at uh, how the routing protocol traffic behaved. Um, and you can do that the same for any other application that's in the traces. You can filter by, by name prefix and, and get, uh, uh, get only the traffic that you care about. So I think it's important to mention what the limitations of this trace set of this um, data set are. Um, so we're, we are aware that uh, the traffic mix traffic uh, mix in this data set is probably not representative of what the future and the end network will look like. Um, unfortunately, this is again a sort of a chicken and egg problem. Until there is such a deployment, we uh, and, and uh, appli real applications running on it, we we cannot know how it, look, it will look like. Um, so this is the best approximation we can provide at the moment with, with the tools uh, and applications that are currently available. Um, the traffic and anonymization, as I already said, it's, it's a very simple. So uh, we hope that uh, other researchers can uh, implement and uh, add uh, better algorithms. And of course, uh, we, we welcome contributions to, to the tool. Uh, if you want to implement a better algorithm, uh, uh, please submit it and we'd be happy to incorporate it. Um, the test bit scale uh, is uh, not very... So the, the data set that, that we have right now is based on the four nodes that I mentioned earlier, and it's uh, US-centric. Uh, basically, we did everything in the uh, contiguous uh, United States. Uh, but uh, in the past, uh, there's an update, a uh, small update here, is that in the past month, we were able to deploy uh, the capture tool in uh, 10 more, onto, onto 10 more routers on the, on the Indian testbed. Uh, so hopefully in the near future, we will have a, a bigger or, uh, yeah, a bigger, a bigger data set with more collection points. And finally, um, uh, the data set uh, is, uh, is just collecting uh, packet traces. So only packet traces are collected. That's, you may say, okay, obviously it's a data set of packet traces. Uh, yes, but NDN is, um, NDN has a stateful forwarding plane, right? And an NDN forwarder has potentially a lot of state that influences its decisions when it has to forward uh, an interest packet. Um, so just uh, by judging from uh, the packet traces, it may be hard sometimes to figure out what the behavior of the forwarder was and why the forwarder decided 
uh, or more specifically a foreign strategy <clears throat> decided to forward a nature's packet onto a specific uh, path rather than another path. And this is especially true if you have uh, uh, partial traces of your network, which is the case uh, for our uh, for our data set because we have four uh, uh, nodes out of 30 and now with 10 more we will still have 14 out of uh, more than 30 nodes but generally speaking it's not practical to assume or require uh, that the, the collection that traffic collection happens uh, at every single router in your whole network so generally speaking it, it could be a hard problem to reconstruct the forwarded behavior based on a partial traffic trace So what, what's next? <clears throat> and from, you know, let's talk about some potential next steps uh, based on what I just said on the limitations. Uh, I think a number of next steps uh, actually derive directly from the limitations and caveats I just mentioned. Um, um, one of them is, is expanding the uh, trace collection or rather expanding the data collection to more than just packet traces. So we want to be able to have a, a full telemetry of the node, including data, data plane telemetry and control plane telemetry. So uh, for instance, uh, telemetry on, on the pit, uh, the pending interest table of the forwarder or um, telemetry on the routing uh, on, on several routing aspects like the uh, routing table. And this, this would make it much easier to figure out, to understand the behavior of the forwarder. And in turn, this would make some of the, some of the goals that I mentioned at the beginning uh, much easier, like uh, troubleshooting or debugging or performance optimization. Or for application developers, one of the requests I've, I've been hearing for I think years um, years now is um, you know an application developer wants to test their application onto the NDN testbed. They connect to the testbed and they start sending traffic. At some point, things don't work as expected, or their traffic uh, goes. I don't know. The, the latency is higher than expected, or just things are not uh, as uh, don't work as well as they expected. So they want to know what happened to their packets. Uh, so how do we, uh, in real time or almost real time, uh, debug this problem and tell the application developer uh, w which path the, their packets went through and why they went that way? Was that an, uh, the application developer, uh, you know, uh, was there a mistake in, in the way they designed their namespace on the, the way they used, uh, I don't know, a multicast strategy, for instance? Um, or, or, or is there a, a bug in the forwarder or there's an opportunity, a missed opportunity for optimization in a forwarding strategy or, or elsewhere? Or was there a routing problem? Who knows? The, the, these are questions that we, I've been, I've heard for many years and it would be nice to gradually move towards um, um, almost uh, a semi-automatic mechanism uh, to answer this question or at least partially. So real-time troubleshooting of the testbed um, from the point of view, both of the network administrator and the application developer. And uh, uh, this implies that we need some sort of on-demand uh, automated and on-demand collection of the traffic uh, filtered by name prefix. Uh, this is specifically for application developers that only want to know uh, what their application is doing or even like a subset of, of their name hierarchy uh, what is what is it doing uh, you don't want to overburden uh, the testbed with with uh, collecting more traffic than necessary uh, especially if there's a lot of traffic and in the future hopefully there will be more traffic on the testbed that the traces can get quite large uh, quite quickly <clears throat> um, finally on the um, well i already mentioned the anonymization the implementation well, the design first and then the implementation of better anonymization techniques, uh, and not just for uh, IP addresses that are in you know, the underlay, but also for NDN names and NDN, NDN packets. 
And finally, uh, developing additional metrics, uh, we have a set of scripts uh, that can analyze traces already. Uh, we've only implemented a few basic metrics, uh, but there's many more uh, that can be added. So again, uh, contributions are welcome there. And moving on to our last slide, uh, this is uh, where you know the community can help with this. Uh, the data set is there. The data set is available. Uh, if you think you can, it can be useful. Please try and download it, uh, use it, and you know let us know if uh, if it was useful or not useful uh, for you. Let us know what else uh, you would need to improve your research or to to optimize your research. Um, to make your research uh, faster or more accurate or more reproducible. Uh, we'd like to hear uh, your feedback on this. And if that, uh, if our data set is, is, doesn't work for you um, and you have, or you, if you have some special needs, then you can still take our toolkit and use it uh, to capture your own traces on your topology or um, in any other way that you want. And we hope that if you do that, you you will also you know publish your traces, um, the traces that you capture, so that everybody else can benefit uh, from from the availability of those traces. Um, and finally, uh, on the testbed, um, the NDN community is having some discussions right now on the future of the testbed, and which I actually like to call a pilot deployment rather than testbed. Testbed is a bit of an overloaded term, uh, but uh, it's too late for that. So it, it, we call it testbed. But anyway, so the the testbed, uh, you know, if you're developing applications, uh, try to use the testbed uh, once you've reached a stage, of course, that is fairly advanced in the development. Uh, we'd like to you to try out your application on the testbed, and if something doesn't know. It doesn't work. Uh, let us know, so we can we can fix that. Um, so that's uh, that's all I have, and uh, I put a few references here to all our code and uh, scripts, and it in the data set, of course, and and the paper that was recently published at uh, ICN. And thanks for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Davido. Very useful work. Um, okay, we have a question. Yeah, no worries. Hi, uh, Rio Yanagida from University of Glasgow. Um, thank you very much again. Uh, like Doug said, it's really interesting work. Um, I think it, these are very important work. Thank you. Um, I had a few questions. Um, so. Could you, sorry, in the beginning, you mentioned something about synthetic. Could you kind of recap on that? I, I didn't quite get what you meant by that. Yeah, so I meant uh, uh, traffic traces can be synthesized. Uh, you basically can write a program and we've seen a few programs that simply uh, mechanically generate a set of packets in a certain order, essentially randomly based on certain parameters. Uh, for instance, the average name length, uh, the average uh, packet size, and so on, with a given distribution. Right. So this is a bit, bit like how the um, quote-unquote custom applications on NDN SIM, for example, does something like this, right? So you, that's the kind of thing you're talking about. Yeah, essentially, yes. Okay. I had I have two more questions. Sorry. Um, one question: Could you show me the um, the throughput um, plot you were showing earlier? Yep. Okay. Uh, did you say the UCLA has the uh, producer? Right. Yes. Okay. And I suspect. So you're saying that the there less traffic, the data traffic on the Memphis is because of the caching. Is that what you suggested? Um. So if every interest packet from all three WashU, Arizona, and Memphis, if all uh, all three if all packets sent by these three uh, routers were, you know, if you forget about uh, caching aggregation, 
all packets would reach UCLA. So the total amount of traffic you you would see at UCLA would be the sum of the of these other three. But that's not the case. I see. I see. So so you, what you're saying is that the the traffic you see on the UCLA plot is the largest. However, it's not quite the the addition of all three other yeah uh, folders. That's what yeah. you're saying. Okay. Correct. Great. Yes. You. It, yes. It is a little more. You're right. It's a little more, but it's not the sum. If it was right, the right. sum, it would yes. be much much larger. I, yeah. I mean, it's quite obvious that it has the most traffic, most amount yes. of traffic, right? But then it's yes. just that it's not quite the like uh, one to one ag aggregate of everything else. Correct. Yes. 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 Okay. We don't expect it to be exactly, you know, uh, the one. You know, it's normal that it's a little more. Uh, you know, that there's more traffic because not all packets can be aggregated. Right. And not all consumers uh, will re be requesting the same files or the same video streams. Yep, so not everything. Yeah. And plus the, uh, the content store, so that, you know, the amount of caching in the end yes. aspect is fairly low. Uh, the content store is pretty small. Which makes sense. Then the last point I wanted to bring up was with regards to the troubleshooting, right, of where the packet went. Uh, do you have any particular ideas? I was thinking the only way you would do that is to have sort of audit log of what the forwarder did at every forwarder and then somehow, I guess, me you know, me mechanically sort of correlate them, I guess is the only way I can think of. But um, uh, do you have any thoughts on this? Yes. So, uh, of course, as you said, if we had all the logs or let's say a snapshot of the state of the forwarder that had every point in time from just before the packet arrived, just after, we would be able to reconstruct everything that happened. Uh, that's uh, highly inefficient in terms of storage, probably, and, and bandwidth um, necessary to move that data around. So uh, we would like to get to somehow compress that state, compress that state to something more manageable that is still you know, useful enough, has enough information in it that allows you to reconstruct what happened, um, at least you know, or maybe on a larger scale, not necessarily at a packet uh, scale, not for every packet or a packet by packet, but uh, sort of a sampling uh, in a sort of a sampling uh, technique. I thought I, sus I suspected that the sort of the logs of forwarding decisions, so like the timestamp, interest name, and then the face, which face it went out if it were to go out, that sort of time timeline would be particularly potentially useful, I, I thought. Yeah. Yeah. If, you know, that that's that's possible today. If you had the logs of NFD of the forward that every node that's already there, so it would already be possible. Um, and so an, actually another, another piece of this uh, uh, to achieve this goal would be to automate that. And because you don't want to be reading logs line by line. Yep. That's the painstaking process. Amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next question, Yusaku. Hi, I'm Yusaku Hamis from NCT Japan. Uh, thank you for your nice talk. Uh, I think it's very important work. And uh, I'm interested in uh, video streaming research, especially the Dash or HLS over CCNX or NN. So I would like to know uh, the about your implementation of the NDN, NDN applications, uh, video applications. So you just did it in the NDN test beds. Yes. Um, so the video streaming application we used is, is also open source. Uh, I, I didn't put a link on the slides, uh, but essentially it's, um, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Shaka player. Oh, I see. Um, so for the, let's say user facing uh, parts, pieces, we, we've used the, the Shaka player and underneath the Shaka player, we plugged uh, an NDN library, uh, an Indian library that runs in the browser. It's a TypeScript library that essentially uh, packages the, the stream requests mm -hmm. in NDN packets and just sends the, uh, the, the requests as NDN interest packets. So basically replacing the networking layer of the Shaka player with, with an NDN interstate exchanges. Okay, I see, thank you. Thank you. 
and then Dave. Um, so a couple reflections. One is, uh, by the way, this is great work. I mean, I, I, we've really needed stuff like this pretty badly, and uh, I hope it. Yeah. I hope other people glom onto it, and we get a lot more work done. But I, I had two quick reflections. One is that as this stuff matures, we have to realize that the instrumentation interests of the application developer aren't necessarily aligned with the in instrumentation interests of the network operator that's operating the forwarders. Um, so often, um, if you're building or operating routers, you don't actually want to uh, uh, spend a lot of energy to debug people's applications for them. Um, so I, I think we need sets of mechanisms that are uh, properly tuned to the needs of the two sort of like sides of this equation. And when you mentioned the question of where did my packet go, um, uh, you really ought to look at the path steering draft because that path discovery uh, will actually tell an application where my packets went. So if we get that implemented on NDN, applications will in fact be able to ascertain where their packets went. Um, I didn't. I didn't hear a question. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yes, I did read. I did read that draft. In fact, I sent you some some comments a long time ago, uh, if you remember. Um, but yeah, sure. Uh, uh, and they've been accommodated in the latest draft. So. Uh, I acknowledge. At least I hope it has, because it's about to be published as an RFC. So we'll, we'll take that under advisement. Um, yeah, maybe it will see, maybe it will see some implementations, um, some implementation in the main forwarders and, and we can, we can leverage that for sure. Um, on, on the first part of your, the first part of your comment, uh, um, I, I completely agree that uh, the needs of the two sets of groups of people uh, eventually will not, uh, they're already not aligned, but eventually they will probably get less and less aligned. Um, uh, I think, however, we're, it's early enough right now that we should probably prioritize the needs of the application developers because it will be the application developers that uh, push and the end forward and allow, you know, the, the just the uh, increase adoption. I think it's, it's critical that we increase adoption of NDN and until the application developers develop applications, until there are more applications based on NDN, that will not happen. So we need to make the ecosystem as easy to use as possible and as easy to debug and troubleshoot as possible. Um, so that's, you know, at least early on, that's what should happen, I think. Um, but I agree with you that eventually the needs will, will We'll, be, we'll have to, you know, balance the needs of the two groups of, of people or users. Thanks. Okay, then there's another question by G. Yeah, it's here from Zhongguan Chun Lab. And uh, it's a good work. We do need some real traces. But you know, to do research evaluation, maybe we need a uh, like some models to scale to different parameters, different uh, uh, situations. So is, is there a future plan to uh, building some model uh, with these real traces? Ah, that's, that's a very good question. Um, actually, yes, uh, we, we, we don't plan to do that ourselves. But it is something that we discussed uh, at uh, great length uh, at the very beginning of the project. Um, we thought that that would that was something that uh, we should do. Uh, then we moved, uh, you know, we kind of had to choose and pick what we would work on, and we couldn't do everything. Um, so we're we're not ourselves right now, as as things are, and with the manpower we have, we're not planning to directly work on that, but we hope that, you know, our work enables someone else, uh, some other groups, uh, some other researchers to do that. Uh, I think that would be very useful. Yes, thank you. Okay, I see, thanks. Thank you. Okay, then, uh, yeah, thank you once again, and really useful work. Thanks for all the questions. Thank you.
And um, so now we are moving into the territory of um, AICN. <laughs> So we know that um, you know many applications um, can benefit from a data-oriented uh, model and data-oriented networking, and there's a sweet spot of applications that um, you know um, work data-oriented, um, but also require some principled way of um, in-network computing support. And so this is exactly what distributed machine learning is about. And so next we have uh, Kirhan talking about some ideas in this direction um, called uh, collective communication. Let me bring up the slides. Uh, thanks, Dirk, for, uh, for the introduction. I'm Kirhan from China Mobile. And uh, today's topic is about collective communication optimization. So previously, uh, we submitted to draw to TSV area and Dirk's uh, thought the, the um, applications listed in the drafts may be interested to, to IC Naji. So I, and today I will present the topic. So next slide, please. So what is collective communication? So collective communication is a term that is used in computing uh, area. So it is used in a parallel computing. It defines uh, an enterprise process communication model that used in distributed AI model training and high performance computing. So uh, you can see that there is, a, there is a word collective inside the term because it will involve a group of processes particip participating in the collective operations. So it, uh, it will you know, include several behaviors like one to all, all to one and all to all, to all mode. And uh, the behaviors it define like uh, data reduction and data movement, and also a data synchronization between different uh, processes. And you can see that the use cases here in the draft that uh, we, it can be used in uh, distributed AI model training and uh, big data analysis, uh, like Spark shuffling, and also it can also be uh, used in distributed storage. So next slide, please. Yes, so uh, what is the problem here? So basically that, that uh, currently the implementation in the underlying network of these collective operations, it's realized in a point-to-point -point mode. Uh, for example, you can see that uh, the, in the upper, uh, in, 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 the, uh, in, in, in the upper uh, face of this uh, slide, uh, the collective operations define several logics like uh, the process one will send uh, three, uh, uh, Three pieces of data to uh, different three different processes in the uh, far away. So in the underlying network, the host one needs to send uh, the same data pieces one by one. And also, you can see that on top, uh, three different processes and will generate three different uh, pieces of messages, and they all send they are all sent to process three at far away. And also in the underlying network, a host one two three will I need to send three different pieces of packets to the other host that uh, uh, one by one. So this mode will inevitably, you know, lead to some uh, uh, bandwidth occupancy and also a large overhead in, in these applications. So it will uh, inevitably lead to the performance degradation. So next slide, please. So what we think that to solve the problem, to reduce uh, the, the data movement, to save bandwidth, so uh, one potential way to solve it is to offload these uh, different collective operations into the network. That is to use a network node to act as a whole to ma manipulate on the packets, do some uh, processing capabilities, and then improve this performance. So next up, please. So how to do this? So uh, there are some design issues inside the protocol design. Uh, for example, in the many-to-one mode, there are some uh, transport issues were listed in the drafts and also in one-to-group mode. As I said, that currently in the underlying network, this data is sent uh, you know, in point-to-point mode, which, uh, which means that we should design uh, some uh, mechanism like IP multicast to you know to transmit the message, but maybe IP multicast may be the not the best, uh, may, may may not be the best, but uh, there is a need to design such uh, a mechanism. And also in the drafts, we list some uh, design issues in the the management and operations. 
Next slide, please. So uh, regarding the transport issues, uh, the first one is reliability. So if you want to, uh, uh, so currently the network node in the intermediate, uh, the node they can they cannot do the computation because they are not aware of the messages uh, it, the, the, the packet sent. So the current uh, point to point end-to-end -end reliability mechanism cannot work well in these uh, scenarios because when there is packet loss, when there is retransmission of the packets, the intermediate node cannot, uh, may not be able to, you know, to, to get the uh, cr cr uh, correctness of the computation. It may be, you know, when they want to do the computation of A1 plus A2 plus A3, it may, uh, when the packet is lost, it can only perform A1 plus A2, or if the packets, it re uh, the packets of A3 is transmitted for twice, so the, it will, you know, the computation may be A1 plus A2 and then plus A3 for uh, twice. So the computation the re uh, correctness may be uh, affected. So how to th solve this? We need the intermediate network node to be aware of the messages it, um, you know, do the computation on, and also uh, the transport function needs to be um, extended or it needs to be modified to to help uh, uh, reach, uh, to help solve the problem. So there are two options. The first option is to build, um, to make the network node uh, have the full transport function. That means we can need, we need to build, establish the transport session between worker to switch and the switch to server. But in this way, the switch needs to be, uh, needs to maintain full transport functions and states. And uh, the, the, there need a lot of space inside the network node. And also the encryption will make it worse. So in another way that the intermediate node doesn't act as an endpoint. So the end-to-end -end principle is maintained. But in this way, the switch doesn't need to maintain um, full transport function states, but needs to be aware of the op operations it, need, it should perform on the packets and needs some loss recovery and the correctness guarantee mechanisms. And next up, please. So in terms of, um, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> no next slide. Is this the last slide? Uh, no, no yeah. actually, uh, I think. So a slight meet echo hiccup here. Let, um, let me try to reload this. Let's see. Yes, so um, I will go uh, quickly go through. So for the intermediate network node, it needs to you know uh, be aware of the uh, messages of inside the uh, collective communication. So there is a semantic gap between the message carrying, message sending in collectives uh, between the uh, and the, the upper under layer underlying network, the, the packets transmission. So what is the semantic gap? Because the messages, it has no limitation of its size, but the packets, it may have some upper limitation like MTU. And also, it will impact uh, the um, like uh, uh, the, the the network node. You need to find a way to combine to con compute and reaffirm the the, the uh, different packets into a whole message to perform. So uh, it will uh, impact the 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 network, uh, the switch buffer, and end to end uh, message sending rate, and also other relevant issues which will impact the transport. Uh, function and the performance. So there is, a, it is a semantic gap between the message sending passing in the collective operations and the, the underlying network. And also um, we have defined some uh, like uh, uh, transport issues listing uh, blocking and non-blocking mechanisms because it will, this uh, mechanism should be adjusted when uh, to the, when we uh, want to introduce the in network computing or collective operations offloading to the network. So uh, these are uh, three uh, perspectives we listed in the drafts uh, about the transport issues. And these transport issues are, uh, are, we, are the major issues we want to talk about in the many-to-one mode. So yes. 
So um, how is the network working for everybody? Because I don't have any connectivity on the IETF network. Okay. Yes. Uh, so if uh, if the, the slides is okay, I think I recommend people, you can uh, view the slides uh, on your laptop. If you... Um, yes. Okay. Um, sorry about that. I'm back online. Uh, last page, yes. Uh, sorry, uh, previous page, previous page of um, this one, uh, uh, previous one, and two slides previous. Yes, this one, please. Yes, uh, re uh, regarding one to all mode, so that's what I said that we need a uh, low latency multi destination de delivery mechanism, maybe like uh, IP multicast. To you know, to improve the behavior of uh, the one to all collective operations, but maybe IP modicas may not be uh, the the good one, or but it's still worth trying. There are some uh, like standardized standardized IP modicas protocols like Beer and the PIM. May be able to extend it to support, but uh, within the scope of ICN, I, th I think there are. Uh, another mechanism to implement one-to-all mode. So I think this can be uh, referenced. So next slide, please. And also we, in the uh, design issues, we'll list uh, some of the uh, issues relative to the, uh, the, the, the management and, uh, and the, the operation level uh, like uh, and, and data and the control. Uh, because uh, you know, when you need to do some network uh, computation within the network, the, the controller or the, the con control plane is know uh, what operations or what behavior you want to do. So uh, relative in-network primitives will be stored or will be defined in the applications. But currently, the in-network primitives is def uh, designed for different applications case by case, and we call it uh, chimney mode. Uh, so we, we should have a more standard de definition on these in-network primitives to avoid waste in network configurations like uh, the common data structure and the common data type to implement this different uh, collective operations used in uh, various uh, applications. And also about the, the, the network topology and to, you know, uh, there is already some already defined topology awareness algorithms but currently, these algorithms are not um, designed with um, INC natively. So the new uh, uh, topology awareness should be based on collective operation offloading. That means uh, when we, um, you know, when we want to do some computation inside the network, we should know. Uh, it's, it's especially when the network scale is very large, and we should know that uh, what network nodes should offload this operations and we need the uh, new algorithms. For example, in class-based topology, find the most suitable in network tree node for offloading these operations is very helpful. And maybe the switch memory and distance and availability issues will be considered in this case. So next slide, please. Yes, so and for this, uh, different uh, and you know design issues. We have uh, listed several requirements for a protocol design, and uh, here are the details. I will not go, uh, you know, due to time limitations, uh, I will not go detail into all of these requirements. But you can view them in the drafts. So next up, please. And also in in the drafts, we have. Uh, uh, prevented, uh, pre presented some uh, analysis. Uh, these analysis are not technical analysis, but some uh, uh, you know uh, analysis that on the the on other uh, ongoing work that may be interest uh, to this topic. The first top, uh, analysis is coenergy. 
because there is another research group. So the coins mainly investigate on um, how network, a network data plane programmability can improve the in internet architecture. And also uh, it uh, you know, covers a broad applications like network function offloading, like uh, in network control, in network caching, and also the machine learning acceleration. So it, its application is very broad. And also that uh, in our case that uh, we focus on the collective communication, the offloading, right? So it's, an, uh, it's necessarily, not necessarily designed with network programmability. These capabilities can be you know, embedded into the network. So another work is presented in the industry as um, uh, originally presented by uh, Melanosk and then it, and currently is you know, embedded into NVIDIA's uh, product products called uh, Quantum 2. And the this app uh, technique is called Sharp Scalable Hierarchical Aggregation and Reduction Protocol. So collective operations like reduce uh, broadcast and others uh, are floated to uh, the switch uh, and that's embedded in, in the this whole, uh, they call DGX uh, AI computing, like uh, it's a giant server, right? So, but currently, you know, this technology is sharp, is based on infinite band network architecture. So there is interoperability issues with the internet, open internet architecture. So another, um, you know, group or uh, SDO is called uh, UCX. We investigated this, um, this group is unified communication framework. So it focus is on designing a framework for collective communication implementation and address the cross-platform functionality and performance portability challenges. So it focuses more on like uh, building a common platform that um, different underlying network architecture or different underlying network, you know, uh, protocols can all fit for fit in this you know, framework. And also uh, it can, uh, based on the, the framework, it can, you know, pro provide some common APIs for different programming models, which include collective communication like MPI, open MPI and PGAS and also other terms, which is currently uh, used in computing, parallel computing uh, you know, community. But I think in the, not uh, in the future, not far away, this, uh, you know, these models may be introduced into like a distributed AI networking. So that's the analysis part. And also, finally, we found some. Uh, we also discussed some uh, like, like issues in the security and operational considerations. And uh, if you want to do offloading of these collectives, it may introduce some security and privacy concerns because it will definitely impact data confidentiality, integrity, and authentication. But um, you know, uh, since these applications are performance driven, it's suggested to deploy these techniques in limited domain first because uh, there is, uh, it, does it does not have to um, pay the penalty of uh, expensive crypto or authority operations and applications can choose to trust the network uh, within the limited domains or they can trust uh, the, the, the network and applications and trust mutually. So I think uh, these techniques can deploy in the main domains for um, the application first, and then maybe we can introduce some uh, uh, secu uh, security, uh, security uh, mechanism inside and uh, extend it to open internet. Yes, next up, please. So yeah, uh, finally, that uh, uh, quick broadcast of uh, upcoming set meeting on Thursday, we will talk about this collect communication offloading issue and the uh, technologies and protocol designs relative uh, topics on the side meeting as it will be held on uh, the uh, on, on Thursday, uh, the, the 12.30 to 4, uh, 14. So uh, the agenda has been published on GitHub and also there is an uh, online meeting WebEx tool for you to join us. So welcome for more discussions and contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Kohan. Yeah, thanks for this introduction. Um, question by Mark. Yes, hi, hello. Um, so, you know, uh, it, it, it's hard for me from, 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 from this presentation to figure out you know, kind of what the target of this work is. Um, you know, people have been accelerating collective 
collectives. I mean, Finaband, you know, Omnipath, um, uh, Cray switches, you know, the now HP Enterprise, um, you know, uh, all of that. So, um, it, it, I mean, is the goal to figure out how to do this more efficiently at an IP layer versus uh, custom uh, layer twos, or, or what's the target? Uh, thanks for the question. I think it's a very good question because no, uh, you know, yes, as you said, I, IP Infinite Band and Cray Slingshot, they have very, you know, um, good solutions from the top, uh, from the very bottom, like link layer to the upper layer uh, to the transport layer. They have, uh, you know, a whole stack solutions. So for us, we want to present the work to Y2 uh, ITF because we want to introduce uh, light, uh, like, uh, the internet architecture to uh, to be uh, suitable to the application for distributed AI training or other applications that will be uh, widely deployed in the open internet in the future. So I think it's a good opportunity for internet to think about how it can be evolved to suit uh, for these applications. Thank you. So uh, one more, uh, so some, uh, one more, one more thing to say that uh, we will focus on, uh, on protocol design on uh, transport and also maybe uh, on there are some relevant issues in the, the IP layer. And so I think it can, it's a cross layer design. So I will just uh, today I want to present uh, there is a design space. So, but uh, uh, how to limit it in a specific area, we will. Uh, move the work uh, to the future work. Thank you. Okay, next in line is Colin. Hi, uh, Colin Perkins, is this, this working, right? Yeah. yeah. Hey, um, so uh, in interesting talk. Um, uh, I think it's, uh, Good, good to discuss this sort of work uh, very, very widely. Um, you, you mentioned that, that you, you know, you just mentioned sort of evolving uh, the, you know, the, the internet to make it suitable for these types of, of application, and you mentioned um, sort of that you thought there were some limitations of the the IP layer there. Uh, and I mean, you're, you're in the information centric networking research group, so presumably you think ICN style protocols uh, can can help here. Um, Yet the talk focused much more on um, things relating to multicast and possibly reliable multicast. Um, can you maybe elaborate on how you see the ICN protocols or, or ICN style protocols uh, helping? Yeah, um, I, I know what you uh, because you know these applications are uh, very you know maybe interested in ICN uh, working group so. But you know, well, I'm it's, not the it's, guy. It's a research group. Yeah, yeah, research group. Sorry, but you know, I'm not the guy. Very, you know, uh, I'm not a specialist in ICN, so uh, I might not have the the you know. Uh, uh, I'm 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 not maybe the right guy to uh, answer your question like this. So, but I think the this topic may be interest to IT in RG. So sorry, <laughs> yeah. I'm not so familiar with ICN, sorry. So maybe I can quickly step in. So, um, um, so the intuition is that, um, so this um, say multi-destination push could be also seen from a different perspective and, and using the, like the implicit um, ICN um, kind of multi-destination feature and request uh, response based. And um, so that would give you um, potentially the advantage that the say the application or the the node does actually not doesn't have to care whether it's a like multicast group or unicast transmission and um, so could be attractive for also building these applications yeah sure and, yeah. and, and, that, and that, that's what that's what i was expecting the answer yeah. to be something like it would be interesting to discuss some of the details right so this is just the first introduction today uh, but yeah i, I totally agree yeah okay. um the, the other point, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned that uh, you, you thought it would be uh, appropriate to deploy this in limited domains initially um, because of the, the security and authentication challenges and so on. Um, and, you know, if, if you're building a product, I suspect that's exactly the right approach. Um, 
again, since, since we're in a research group, I, I would encourage you to think about you know, the research challenges around how to make um, you know, broader deployments feasible uh, and to reduce the cost and the challenges of um, you doing this securely in a the, in the trustworthy manner. Sure, thank you. Okay, and then we have Felicia. Uh, I think uh, the issue I have in mind, uh, the Colin already mentioned, that is the security. Uh, I don't know if you remember, I was sitting at this uh, uh, CCO uh, table Sunday, and the heck Sunday, I yeah. brought up the security question. It's great that you have a slide on that. Sure. Although I'd like to see further elaboration exactly what you people plan to do addressing security challenges. You mentioned that this design largely focused on the transport. Right. As you know, to this transport, nobody is using plain TCP anymore. Mm. It's OTLS. So mm. I don't think one could just say, oh, there's a trade-off as an answer. I think security is not an option if you plan to do this over distributed environment. It is a must. Thank you. Thank you. Several for the comment. Yeah, great. I mean, to, to be fair to, to Kahan, I mean, this is um, the very first introduction of this topic um, to the IRTF, ITF community. And um, so this is basically just opening up um, all the options. And um, I think it was great to get this feedback. Uh, so, so we think that there is uh, really good work um, that um, ICN con con can contribute in this direction. Because what Lisha said is, is um, yeah, very correct. So the current, um, say, really performance-oriented deployments in data centers, they are partly using TCP and like RDMA, like protocols, and um, they don't do security because it's too expensive. And um, so a new protocol design could uh, maybe try to marry these um, different concerns, so performance and security. And I think that that's the interesting challenge for us. Thank you. Thanks, Gern. Okay, and um, so we are continuing with um, like distributed computing and um, I'm not talking about uh, microservice architectures. And um, I'd like to welcome uh, Xu Ting to present this topic. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, let me just give you the control. Uh, yes. Um, uh, hello, everyone. My name is Li Xu Ting. I'm from China Telecom. And uh, my talk today, uh, today is the uh, overview of distributed architecture for uh, microservice communication. Um, my presentation will around this aspect, including background and motivation, uh, overview of our architecture, and some com uh, comparisons and uh, future development considerations. And uh, below is the link to our draft. If you are interested, please feel free to review it. And the next page, please. Uh, you, you can control the slides yourself with your cursor keys. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, this is a delight. Uh, can you see the second page? Yes, we see service mesh concepts and challenges. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, in recent years, with the rapid growth of microservice, and uh, service mice has played a crucial role as a key solution in microservice communication and uh, management. It could automate and manage communication of microservice provides such capabilities like security, observability, and uh, traffic management. And uh, uh, the following fingers is the evolution of service governor's capabilities. And uh, the service governor's capability has evolved over three generations, you know, uh, from the current service mice. And uh, the first 
inviting business code and then it consolidated into SDKs and now it integrated into source mice. And this trend is towards the carbon source governors from business logic focusing on infrastructure centric solution. But the source mass still has some problems and uh, challenges. And uh, this fingers the architecture of the existing steel source mass. And uh, uh, it relies on, uh, uh, it relies on proxies for routing all traffic and uh, use the pilot component in the control clean for source registration and routing rules. However, this controlized approach can lead to potential issues such as uh, perform bottlenecks, a single point of failure risk that could disrupt the entire source mass and so on. And uh, uh, considering the above 10 years and China Telecom's 20, 7.1% uh, year-on-year growth in the cost service market. We require an innovative solution that um, it should adapt to, to the continuing uh, growing demands of microservice communication and it should feature into in service telemetry capabilities and uh, provide robust channels and uh, offer flexible scheduling capabilities. And uh, most important, uh, it should information-centric communication. And because the uh, network environment is ongoing um, and presented transformation uh, with the shift towards a uh, centric par paradigm become increasingly prominent. And in the process of this evolution, source mass suffers as a source centric architecture, uh, which aligns with the goals of uh, information centric network. And by combining the con uh, content centric nature of ICN with the source uh, centric focus of uh, source mass, we can achieve a higher degree of integration of uh, content and source mass prepare a microservice network towards a more distributed, highly adaptive, and uh, efficient communication architecture. Mm. So uh, we have pro uh, proposed the ATF draft that wants a new communication architecture called uh, uh, distributed architecture for microservice communication. And uh, um, my purpose, uh, the draft to propose is to combine the information-centric network concept and the source mind to enhance the overall performance, scalability, and uh, uh, reliability of microservice communication. And uh, DMC has the uh, following characteristics, uh, such as content entry, it pro uh, prioritizes content and source, and uh, uh, it distributes uh, process processing and storage capabilities by uh, source gateway and uh, source routers, and uh, it can optimize resource allocation by source mice. Scheduling center and uh, it accommodates the evolving demands of the network. Uh, so, here are uh, more details about our DMC. And uh, our architecture consists of four key components and its source gateway, uh, it manages and controls communication traffic. And uh, this router, it's uh, optimized routine based on prefix and topology. And uh, this pre prefix authentication, uh, SPA, uh, well, it, it can validate prefix usage by microservice. And uh, through mass communication schedule center, it can assist in uh, optimizing uh, communication policies. Uh, in, in summary, um, 
our architecture decentralized the routine decisions via source grid via source routers and uh, routine optimization based on uh, SCSC and uh, enhanced uh, security via prefix authentication. And uh, to ensure a smooth communication between various components, we have designed uh, the following signaling message to instruct a communication component on the actions they should take to ensure proper data transmission in the network. And uh, below is uh, details information on these signaling messages. And uh, such as we uh, between port and source gateway uh, is source prefix announcement and uh, microservice uh, within its port communicates the used uh, source prefix to the SG and uh, between SG and SR this is a source prefix SA and uh, uh, SG and SR network is uh, source prefix and port link a uh, link relationship is the carriage and uh, uh, between SG and uh, SPA, this is a uh, source prefix authentication. Uh, the SG authentication to the SPA request by the port is illegal. Uh, is illegal. And uh, mouse, uh, SGSR and SASA, this, uh, this is source QS telemetry and source QS policy. And uh, this can communication quality reporting process between microservice to the SCSC. And the uh, next is the uh, uh, orchestration process in DMC. This is a delay unit. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, can you help me? We are now looking at slide number eight. Comparison between the aim. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's pay it, let's pay it. And uh, the communication process begins a uh, controlling and uh, um, the first uh, microservice micro notifies their unique service prefix to connect to service gateways and then uh, service gateway verifies service prefix or service prefix link state data advertisement. And uh, then service gateways use the uh, SP signaling to communicate with the source routers and uh, uh, other uh, microservice and uh, service gateways adopt similar process for notification. And uh, source gateway interact with source router to generate link state database with received service prefix link state uh, advertisement. And uh, forwarding information with guides traffic, uh, traffic forwarding and routing for optimal uh, optimal path selection. And uh, once the uh, components in the control plane complete of, of uh, coordination and decision making, the forwarding plane uh, begins to take effect. And, uh, when the packed arrived and the source gateway, it selects the best path and next hop according to the rules in the uh, forward information base to forward the package to the target uh, target microservice, and in this way, the source gateway and source router can work together to forward this package along the uh, optimal path, ensure effective, efficient transmission at correct uh, routing of traffic, and. Uh, Uh, and below are some comparisons between DMC and SGO source mice. 
and uh, um, compared to SDO3's mice, DNC can not only achieve the main functions of traditional source mice, but more importantly, support information centric communication method. This provides a new approach for the evolution of um, future, uh, future networks, which is to implement information centric network uh, from the network infrastructure level. Uh, so we have chosen to process, uh, propose such a distributed architecture uh, instead of using the original uh, source mass. And uh, however, however, our present concept for the original architecture is still in its preliminary state and has not yet fully matured. Therefore, we need to uh, under, uh, undertake a significant amount of work for, to further refine it. Uh, the following is the timeline for our project, which includes some current work and future uh, considerations. And uh, no, uh, there are no um, uh, work architecture refined, and uh, we plan to refine the architecture of our uh, distributed, uh, distributed source mass, uh, including uh, distributed um, routine, routine protocols. And uh, then we uh, plan to uh, allocate res resource to invest in research and development. And then uh, we plan to cooperate with the later scenes of of source mass and uh, our ultimate goal is to facilitate the deployment of uh, DMC. Uh, and uh, here are some references from our draft. Mm, uh, that's the main content of our scheme and uh, any comments, please feel free to contact me via email. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sitting. Okay, do we have questions? Um, Colin. Hi, uh, Colin Perkins again. I'm sure I'm not the only one who has questions. Um, so uh, I think this is great. Um, it's, it's certainly always interesting to um, hear about uh, people trying to build large scale systems using the ICN style protocols. Um, I, I was uh, wondering though if, if you could maybe say a little bit more about how the um, ICN concepts were applied in the design uh, and, and how they helped, or perhaps about what are the ongoing sort of challenges you see um, in, in uh, applying these, this style of uh, protocols in this domain? Did you understand the question? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I hear it, and uh, uh, my network is not good here. Um, uh, can I ask my colleagues on site to help me to answer this question? Yeah, uh, again, from Tower Telecom, uh, if I understand your question correctly, uh, you ask uh, uh, what challenge we are faced now to accomplish this uh, architecture? Uh, I guess I was asking Eva how, how, if you could say a little bit more about how ICN protocols or ICN style protocols helped, or, if, or what are the problems you see with applying these ICN style protocols? You know, I mean, you, you seem to be building a really interesting system. I'd just like to understand a little bit more about, um, yeah, what, what are the challenges, what are the successes for this this type of approach to building this sort of system? Uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, the main aim of the this uh, uh, proposal is want to build one uh, uh, infrastructure uh, to facilitate the communication between the 
different service, uh, different vehicle service. Uh, so uh, uh, currently the the uh, the infrastructure is provided the uh, centralized centralized uh, uh, infrastructure like ISTO, and uh, the, there are some problem for the uh, uh, for the accessibility and the uh, uh, manageability. So we we want to uh, achieve the similar service uh, by the distributed architecture. Uh, and the uh, the key point uh, that we want to use the ICN technology is uh, uh, currently the microservice communication is based on the uh, uh, based on the URL or not not based on the uh, IP uh, IP address. So this is the uh, the same aim as the ICN. So you know we have designed the SG and as router as our router we uh, in the infrastructure they, uh, they forward the traffic based on the uh, uh, content or based on the content not on the, uh, the IP address. So uh, we will uh, the most challenging things. Uh, here, uh, I think maybe the uh, uh, extensibility or or the uh, uh, or the for the efficiency of the SR route because they are forwarding the traffic based on the uh, 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 inf based on the content, not on the IP address. Okay, so so the challenge is doing it eff efficiently. Based but uh, there are some person uh, uh, folks on the. Uh, research on the challenge, so I think they have uh, some um, solid uh, 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 experience to solve the uh, challenges. So I think we have the confidence to uh, uh, to uh, build such infrastructure uh, step by step. Okay, thank thank you. Yeah, maybe one um, related question. Um, so when you want to design something like microservice systems um, using ICN, there are of course different design options, right? So and so here it seems you um, are using like kind of bespoke entities, so like service gateway and and these kind of things um, that seem to be inherited from maybe the existing microservice architectures a little bit, or from some maybe deployment constraints. And I was wondering, since you are apparently at the beginning of the design phase, um, would you also maybe consider different design options so that uh, are maybe even more distributed, maybe require less of um, these bespoke gateways, entities, and so on? Because there have been other, um, other works in, in ICN for distributed computing. Um, and I'm just, um, I think for maybe if we discuss this uh, next time, it could be good to understand the constraints a little bit and maybe also discuss different design options. That's that's my, my comment. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, is the, the, the draft proposal for our architecture, I think we can incorporate other elements from ICN to enhance the design of the overall architecture. Okay, um, so would you be interested in getting uh, more feedback from from the group on like uh, design options for for this problem? Uh, we we just want to find uh, um, some entity to uh, uh, to implement the uh, ICM based uh, uh, routing and folding. Mm. So uh, if if there are uh, some entity can provide such. Uh, uh, such product or proto product we can uh, build on some some proto network to uh, uh, to verify the concept and architecture. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And one more question by Rio. Hi, uh, Rio Yanagida, University of Glasgow. Um, so one of the design motivation or the aim was the end-to-end -end telemetry so improving on that end given the earlier discussions we've already talked about how difficult it is to trace things end-to-end -end. do you have any particular um maybe approaches you're thinking about trying to solve this issue because i think it's it's a challenge that i think a lot of us are already discussing here, like throughout the research group. 
Yeah, uh, we, we, uh, for, for service elements, we just want to use the uh, uh, current uh, uh, traditional solution because the, in our design architecture, the, the service elements is also accomplished by the centralized solution. It is, this is similar with the current solutions. So uh, maybe, maybe the, the SCS entity will send some uh, telemetry uh, command to the to service end to service hand end and uh, he uh, the service hand end initiate the uh, service test required service quality test required to the service end and report the result to the S, to the centralized entity. This is the traditional solution. Mm. We have think uh, a, a, a bit a bit of, uh, think a little for the such uh, designs. Main main focus on the uh, the realization of the uh, routing uh, architecture. Okay, great. Thank you very much to all presenters. And um, just a few pointers at the end. So there is a, a Metaverse um, site meeting today. Uh, if people are interested, uh, that's at um, 3 p.m. in uh, Carlin 4. Um, and um, just a quick reminder, so um, in addition to um, the um, collective communications meeting that Kuhan mentioned, there's also, say, a more, say, hardware or performance-oriented um, um, meeting on um, AI and data centers. So that's um, also today um, at 5 p.m. Thank you very much for coming and um, yeah, looking forward to continuing this discussion next time. Bye-bye. And thanks to uh, Dave and to Mark for, for joining at this um, crazy time of the day. Take care.